It's the Magic Untap podcast on magicuntap.com, YouTube, and your favorite source for podcasts. Hello and happy Friday there, Magic players. I am Barry White here on the Magic Untapped podcast. With me is both Jim Avery and Evan Simon, two writers for MagicUntapped.com. Gentlemen, how are you? I am doing pretty good for a Thursday. How, Evan, how are you doing? I'm, I'm, not, I'm not doing too bad myself. It's pretty great out right now. Right, yeah, record on Thursday, put this out on a Friday. So it is technically Thursday, but for everyone listening, it is Friday. Um, one of those cool time warp things. Let's do the time warp again. And you know what right. else we should do again? Mm. Is uh, We should thank our Patreon subscriber, Lino Hernandez. Lino, thank you very much for the support. And if you want to support this podcast or listening, you want to support the podcast or the YouTube channel for Magic Untapped or the website, magicuntapped.com, just hop on to patreon.com slash magicuntapped, throw a dollar in a tip jar or be a $5 subscriber and get a shout out like Lino just did. We definitely appreciate your help. Right, fellas? Very much. Absolutely. All right. Well, something that needs a little help right now apparently was the historic format. Wizards of the Coast has announced technically three bands. Tybalt's Trickery, now banned in historic. Memory Lapse, now banned in historic. And Brainstorm, which had been suspended pending review, is now also banned in historic. Okay, Evan, moving to you. Uh, it's not really a surprise. They've been under, one of them has been under review since what, forever? Uh, so. <laughs> it's been a minute, yeah. Yeah, and, uh, with everything going on Magic right now, it was, it was just like, it was kind of obvious it was going to happen at some point. It was just, it was just going to happen now. <laughs> yeah, I, I know I've been seeing on uh, Twitter and on Reddit, a lot of people are saying, you know, I'm, I'm running into six, seven, eight Tibble Trickery decks in a row. Um, maybe I'm lucky. I don't think I've run into six, seven, or I don't even know if I've run into three or four. Um, maybe I've just been getting lucky on, on the matchmaking um, uh, on, uh, on Arena. I don't know, but I've definitely run into to memory lapse uh, more than a multitude of times, and it is beyond frustrating. I wish the card was this powerful in Homelands when it came out. Yeah, if you're getting that card as much as you're getting land cards, there's an issue. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Yeah, geez. Those, for the cost that these cards have, I think they just have way too much of an outsized effect, so I'm not at all surprised at this. And then we also have uh, some... I guess you can call them edits. Uh, Wizards of the Coast edited uh, five of their digital-only cards. Um, they they changed Davril's Withering and Davril's Soul Bro Broker. Uh, Withering now used to target any uh, creature. Now only targets your opponent's creatures because of a very abusable, easy-to-abuse combo. Kind of same thing with Davril's Soul Broker. Um, used to be able to target your own creatures. Now you can only target your opponent's. Faceless Agent. Went from being a 3-drop 2-1 to a 3-drop 2-2. Two, two. Sarkin, Wanderer to Shiv, its second ability, went from a plus 0 to a plus 1. And Subversive Acolyte um, used to be 2 black for a 2-2. Two, two. Um, and now it costs black and 1 for a 2-3. What do you guys think, just in general, the fact that with these digital-only cards, Wizards of the Coast is literally eradicating, uh, editing them, changing them um, while they're live. I could see them doing this for, you know, tabletop eligible cards, because I think it's a lot better than just banning cards, frankly, because then people have gone out of their way to get these cards, and then they can't use them anymore. It sort of feels like a waste, but if you can just make the cards balanced before they actually get printed, it's it feels like maybe the job they should have been doing before the cards get printed but i mean you, you know what i mean it's it seems like a better way to balance the game in my opinion do you feel this those sets uh, a precedent that maybe could become a bit of a detriment to the game in the future at least on the digital side personally i would not say so i'm having trouble seeing the downside at least looking at it from a digital only lens and it looks like it, at least for now it's digital only and i have a hard time seeing how printed cards could get edited like this so yeah. so there there is already is precedent on this they're just doing it on a much faster scale now 
I did want to point out the complete lack of changes to standard because I saw a semi-professional magic player who is very, very upset that nothing has been changed as far as standard goes. Specifically with the card uh, Alrin's Epiphany, which lets people take another turn. They said it was just ruining the game for them, and they might even just dip out until a new set comes out. You know, I'm glad you brought that up, Jim, because that actually did kind of surprise me, because uh, that, that card is no fun to play against, uh, despite its high casting costs. I mean, free, free turns, especially one that people have been able to get repeatedly in, in succession, multiple free turns, uh, which also, with this card giving you the two 1-1 one, one, uh, Crow tokens, it builds an army for you as well. Um, another card I was a little surprised about was uh, Isika's Chariot, um, also a token generation um, card that is also no fun to play against. So I'm, I'm glad you brought that up, Jim. Yeah, this is it, it's a surprising move, because I've seen them ban what I feel are less disruptive cards. I'm not going to uh, disagree with you, uh, but let's talk about something that some people will disagree with, uh, and that is the Secret Layer Drop series that Wizards <laughs> of the Coast does. Uh, I know that it has its fans. It has, uh, well, it's not fans, um, and even that's multi-layered, but um, yeah, it was just announced uh, on, uh, on Thursday here, a uh, number of, uh, of Secret Layer Drops coming out for... Uh, uh, for the October Super Drop 2021. Uh, we have Miradin Sanity, which are the five artifact lands, which some pretty uh, pretty trippy artwork. Uh, we also have Monster Anatomy 101, which are some uh, big name creatures like Ildrog the Raised Boar and Protean Hulk with uh, some interesting uh, black and white, almost textbook, biology textbook looking um, artwork. We have Thrilling Tales of the Undead, uh, which is made to look like uh, the old B-movie uh, movie posters and, and whatnot of yesteryear. We have Read the Fine Print, which is um, basically all about Liliana and the contract she had with the four demons who uh, basically she set a bargain for her soul with. We have Showcase Midnight Hunt, which are the, uh, the monochrome... Um, looking, if you remember the, the, the lands that, that are in Innistrad Midnight Hunt, the mo they're monochrome lands, but of the uh, lands from previous uh, Innistrad, like uh, Slayer Stronghold and what have you. There's also Monster Movie Marathon, which again goes back to some of those um, 1970s and 1980s, a little more modern than Monster Anatomy, but um, still those, uh, those kind of horror genre uh, films of that time. And then we have Secret Lair crossing with Stranger Things. Evan, where shall we start with this? Whew. Okay, so uh, I usually like different artwork on cards. I think it's always neat. You know, you got different styles and things like that. It's getting a little uh, weird here, but it is Halloween. So, you know, I guess that cancels that out. But Stranger Things, it's just another tie-in. They've done a lot of tie-ins in the last few years. Just another long line of tie-ins, really. And tie-ins with unique card names, meaning these are the only, this is the only place you can ever find these cards, at least for now. Um, they say they're going to put some on the list and people will be able to get them eventually and set in collector boosters, maybe. If they're lucky, they'll find one. But, Good luck uh, playing that in Legacy. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, Legacy players definitely do not like these things. Um, kind of ruins the game, really. Uh, at least it ruins the spirit of the game. You know, the fantasy aspect of it grounds the game maybe a little bit too much. But um, I don't know. I mean, we've had the, Evan, like you said, we've had a few of these tie ins um, now, and we have a few more, including a Street Fighter and Fortnite tie in coming up. Mm. Oh, starting with Jim, uh, Jim, what, what's your overall feeling about, about these third party, whether it's uh, through Secret Lair or otherwise? What, what's your opinion on these third-party tie-ins in Magic the Gathering now? I, mean, I just have to say, with Street Fighter, you brought me up so high, and then with Fortnite, you brought me back down so low. <laughs> but, um, honest, honestly, as a secret lair thing, I don't think it's particularly any worse or different than the rest of the secret lair stuff. I think 
it's meant to be something for collectors, and if they're going to go for these tie-ins to find appeal for more collectors, then, you know, I, I guess I'm okay with that, honestly. But, I don't know, I guess there, there does seem to be something a little bit cynical about it, and you're right, it's not really the feel of magic anymore. Like, especially now with Fortnite, I can't imagine how that like just imagine you're playing a game and you're putting out like nickel bolus or whatever card that you'll never actually put out and then someone else drops like a battle bus on it and it's like well I, i've just been completely taken out of this this is, so i don't know and is as, as a collector's thing it's fine as a game thing I don't, i'm a lot more iffy on it personally evan well, I think they're trying to get younger, more younger players in this too, because you know, look at the things they're doing. I mean, they had what the My Little Pony one a few years back. They had well, that was uh, for charity, and that was silver bordered. That's so that true, one really but, is for collectors. Okay, nonetheless, it did come out. Um, but uh, also, you know, Fortnite. They have uh, you know Stranger Things, and that's gearing towards a younger audience. And for it's good that they're gearing towards a younger audience. You need to get more people into the game. But also, it's you know, like what Jim said, there's some problems with that. And it used to be a, like a special thing. These things, like. Uh, Robot Chicken had a special card come out about 10 years ago, and that was like a really big thing because it was one of their first ones that they really had like a media tie-in with, and it was just a limited number. And now it's coming out, well, like almost every three months, another one of these, and it's becoming a bit much now, it seems Coming like. out or announced or something along that, that pattern. I would like to counter, I, I would like to know who these younger players are who are young enough to really appreciate Stranger Things and also have $40 to drop on nine cards. Where, what's this demographic? Well, Stranger Things is just the most recent one. It's just, just more of a long line of that. And also, uh, it's something to shoot for for kids, too. Remember baseball cards back in the day? All the special card, card types you could get, kids were dropping it like a lot of money on these just to get like a special, oh, game-worn jersey card. And now... Magic is doing something like that here, where they're like, "Ooh, ma special uh, Stranger Things card." So and they Jim may not. Jim, let's face it: it's mommy and daddy buying the cards, not the kids. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're right on that one. Well, joining us during the daytime, Jason Egaden is a research professor in social economics at a major teaching hospital. Outside of work, he throws on his superhero cape, and his passion for magic and giving back to the community has led him to founding both Weird Cards Charitable Club and Magic Kids. Jason, welcome to the Magic Untapped podcast. Glad to have you here. Thanks so much, Barry. It's great to be with you again. Yeah, so uh, for those who don't know, uh, just what's the give us a crash course on Magic Kids. You bet. Well, uh, several of us at uh, said major teaching hospital in the Midwest uh, would get together at lunchtime and play Magic the Gathering. And for those of you who have always wanted to kind of do the games for a good thing, perhaps you've heard of Extra Life where uh, Wizards of the Coast and some others raised money for children's hospitals. We really wanted to get in on that one year. And so we hosted uh, some commander at my house and uh, people wanted to do it every month and it started getting really crazy really fast. Okay, now just full disclosure, um, the major teaching hospital, um, he's not representing the hospital uh, as part of this podcast, but I, I think we can say that it does share its name with a, uh, a popular sandwich condiment though, right? We can, we can say that much. Safe to say, yes. Yes. Uh, and so uh, we really kind of tried to find this uh, love for giving back, combine it with the love of Magic the Gathering. Uh, and what we found was we could do that. Um, we had an interest in, the, in health services. So um, we, we started finding that magic was also great for the intellectual health of, of young adults in both our own experience as uh, teachers and researchers, but also our network of Magic the Gathering players. And you've actually seen improvements in the players, like uh, cognitively or? Yeah, so that's hard to measure. As a researcher, I'm always careful to say like that we haven't done, you know, double blind placebo controlled studies on whether magic uh, ticks up the, you know, quantitative improvement on standardized test taking or any of that uh, stuff. But we do feel and we feel strongly that it's the, the right thing to do. So um, we have worked with boys and girls clubs in our areas. And in fact, we have Magic Kids programs in all 50 states. Yes, even the small ones, even the sparsely populated ones, 
we send uh, Magic Kids kits to teachers. And what makes that work where maybe dumping off bulk at a library does not work is that leaders actually self-nominate and then they apply for our help on our website, magickids.org, and they receive uh, materials to get started. Yes, that it does include cards, but it also has sleeves, deck boxes, dice, score sheets, and, and other things like that. So yes, locally we have seen improvements in kids from, for example, being nonverbal to being interactive with their peers, um, from maybe sitting on the sidelines and, and coloring, which is fine, uh, you know, coloring in the cards themselves or coloring uh, what, what the card looks like to actively participating in, in games. And so um, not to get too meta about it, but we're not so concerned about six-year-olds knowing the stack as we are the participatory kind of inclusive environment that creates the space um, for people to kind of um, learn what they want to take away um, at, at that point. Whatever helps, you know? <laughs> right. But So I have a daughter. She just turned four um, literally this past Monday. And mm -hmm. she loves looking at my magic card. She loves watching right. me play, whether it's on arena or in person with, with some friends and whatnot. Um, what's the youngest you've seen uh, through Magic Kids uh, learn how to play? And how, how, how did they do in, in your just fly on the wall opinion? Yeah, I think um, the youngest has been about four to five years old. And again, are they going on tour like uh, Dana Fisher and, you know, crushing legacy tournaments? No. Um, what we're really concerned about is, again, creating an environment in which kids can meet magic on their level. And in fact, we always cringe when we hear people say um, something like, oh, you're getting them hooked early. It's like, no, that's not really what we're, we're about. This isn't you know, this isn't the, you know, vaping of the games world. This is really, um, again, giving um, tools for teachers and students to meet any level of magic which they're comfortable with. So, you know, the four and five-year-old younger siblings that come to our um, sessions for homeschoolers, for example, um, we have kind of this sort build play arrangement. So we'll often sort a random assortment of cards with kids and then we will uh, build decks anywhere from as little as uh, 20 cards up to 100 cards. Um, sometimes we even think about the two card deck idea which is one land and one creature. So in other words you you can strip a lot of the of magic away and still leave the fundamental element of playing a land, tapping the land for mana, using the mana to cast a creature. Maybe it's a 1-1 one, one goblin with haste and you've just tapped a mountain, and they can attack with it. And they can attack me with it. I might have a life total of one point, so I might have a die with uh, a one pip on it, and they swing in and they kill me. And a four- or five-year-old loves that. They don't need to know how the stack works. They've, they've already learned 70% of magic with a two-card deck. Um, and so uh, even talking with kids about kind of the five personalities of magic and the colors um, – goes a long way to just them feeling comfortable with exploring another world without necessarily needing to be a, a level two judge. Just wait until they figure out that math is for blockers. <laughs> right. Who needs it? <laughs> <laughs> now, um, so it's one thing to come up with this idea. It's something completely different to have it where you guys have it now being in all 50 states and everything. How mm -hmm. is that in between? I mean, yeah. were, there, were there some struggles in, in, in getting it launched and, and getting people to buy into it? Yeah, so um, I think most of us who've been around the game for a while have run, uh, run into these walls where you want to be charitable. Um, you love the, the game, so you want to be an ambassador for the game. Maybe you want to be able to raise money the, with the local game store. Maybe you want to do Extra Life. And all those things are great, and they're legitimate. And what we found was in our group, um, it became sort of solving, solving this issue of, well, we have – a lot of these extra cards, and um, we're we're also raising we're also raising money every month. But we were raising so much money um, that you know the family family attorney was like, you know, maybe set up a social club, kind of like a fraternity or a, a rowing club or a whiskey club, where you just kind of pool your resources, and that way, kind of the IRS knows what's going on, and uh, everything's kind of on the up and up. It's not an illegal gambling ring. Um, that sort of thing. So we, we set up Weird Cards Charitable Club uh, to kind of do that, to kind of have a, a loose 
organization, a social club that could um, that could really uh, pool resources and, and put it together for you know an extra life event or any other thing that we wanted to do in LGSs. Our name had kind of gotten out there, so we kind of went national before we went regional in a weird kind of way. Um, and so, you know, we did Grand Prix, we did, um, you know, Star City Games um, stuff. And so, um, you know, that the, the Magic Kids thing came slightly after this um, nebulous idea of maybe we should just do some accounting to not get in trouble. <laughs> And now this is a fully fledged charity, right? The status of the charity is like full 501k and everything like that. Yeah. And in fact, like I, I admittedly, I was the one who pushed back on it. So we have about 60 volunteers now, and many of them have been with us for the last six years or so when we're trying to figure this out. And, um, and so admittedly, I'm like, you know, I have a full-time job. I'm a research professor. I do, you know, I'm an analyst um, by day for, a big teaching hospital and I, I don't have time to kind of figure all the like solve what I thought were or that we thought were kind of the the op or the problems or the opportunities around charitable giving how they were kind of one-off events and then people were like well you're sending you're sending you're collecting cards at these big events and you're sending stuff to teachers and you're having them apply for them so that's like on educational services and that qualifies as a 501c3 charity which believe me i've learned a ton about nonprofits in the last <laughs> six years actually having to figure out how to do it and, yeah, and crash course right yeah and, and not you know get in trouble with the family attorney or the tax attorney or the the the, the accountant or any of the volunteers and so we basically by necessity and by growth we had to set up a, a 501c3 be able to deal with members of the public there's no more of this well you're a member of our club now wink wink it was like <laughs> all right we're dealing with the public we want to be able to have a gift shop we want to be able to go places and sell things and give all the money to charity we wanted to give to other charities doing things that uh, we're helping our community and our kids so um a, a c3 really helps you do that um if you're impatient and stubborn enough like we were to be like darn it this is different this is new this is us and we're going to do it uh, our way, but we're going to do it the right way, too. It's worth a few extra IRS tax forms, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. You know, so there, there, sure, there's a lot of forms. And, you know, uh, shout out to all the people who make a living um, with groups like me filling out paperwork and helping me submit that. And, um, you know, it's, um, it's not for the faint of heart, but um, it's been a Surprising and extraordinary journey, that's for sure. And of course, being a 501c3 charity on the uh, donation side, there's a, there's a write-off. So yes. um, so to keep in mind when uh, people do their taxes, uh, uh, Magic Kids, send stuff to them, write it off in your taxes. Yep, you can. Um, now, one thing I will say <laughs> is that uh, people will say, well, you know, I have all this bulk and, you know, um, a you know, Card Kingdom or TCG or name your online store, they sell those for 25 cents a piece. So I'm just going to tell the IRS that I'm donating thousands and thousands of 25 cent cards. Unfortunately, that is, um, that is not what's called fair market value. Fair market value is an arm's length assessment, meaning whatever you can sell it for now to a dealer or on eBay buy it now, that's actually what you're talking about. So um, a lot of people are somewhat surprised and maybe a little disappointed to learn that magic, the the fair market value of magic cards is generally three, $3 per thousand. And so if that still makes it worth cleaning out your closet and, and mailing it to us or donating it at a, uh, at a show, great. Um, other people take the time to itemize it. If it's over $500, they itemize it. And so we're just like Goodwill. We, we essentially give a, a receipt that the donator has to fill it out uh, for the IRS. It's on the donor. And now whether it's, the price guide. <laughs> right. Uh, now, whether it's cards or cash or, mm -hmm. or yep. time, yep. how can someone support the charity? That, a great question. So magickids.org is the clearinghouse for all kinds of giving, giving of your time, giving of uh, your cash, giving of cards, giving of um, new supplies, or if you're an LGS and you have overstock of, we've taken everything from thousands of play mats to, uh, our largest donation, we've had two $10,000 donations this year from um, Card Kingdom and from Command Zones. That's Very been incredible. Generous. 
very generous. We've also have had grassroots uh, donations of as little as $2 um, through our portal. When we do online Oathbreaker play, we just had a Oathtoberfest in January and, uh, and last week. So um, Oathbreaker is our kind of homemade format that caught fire a couple of years ago. I, I have uh, two Oathbreaker decks uh, in my closet right now, actually. <laughs> Hopefully we can dust those off soon. Yeah, well, I'm waiting for a Magic Fest to bring them to. Right, right. Right. Now, what, what, what's, what's maybe the, the oddest or the most spectacular or just the most eye-catching um, donation, um, cash or physical goods that, that uh, Magic Kids has received? Yeah, we've gotten a Gaia's Cradle, which was, of course, fantastic. It's about an $1,100 card. Wow. Uh, um, we, we often, um, the most humbling gifts, um, even as recently as a couple of days ago, is a memorial gifts. So people who have family members who passed on, unfortunately, who said, you know, I got literally like two days ago from Australia, a guy was like, you know, my brother taught me to play Magic 26 years ago. And unfortunately, he passed away 24 years ago and I still remember him you know, on his birthday and and this year I wanted to give you guys some money to recognize uh, his memory and uh and just like always making sure to just like take the time to put things in perspective take the time to write that person back and say you know may his memory be a blessing and thank you so much and uh you know it's guys cradles are nice but somebody's heartfelt support of your organization means means that much more um so yes we've gotten you know people who've passed away where their loved ones i had somebody drove over from wisconsin this is a couple months ago during covid they said um he had passed away but um he had always talked so highly of you and so like here's his entire collection he has packs he's never open you know um and just you know you can tell somebody um loved the game right you can you can always tell when somebody loved the game and so i i emailed um i think this person's mother and i said you know i can tell that so much love and care was put into this collection and it's just it's a privilege to um put it to work so um those are the most um surprising and and like when you put a tweet out or you do an interview or you never know you just never know who sees it, who hears it, who it resonates with. And that's, that's the most surprising and, and crazy thing about this whole thing. Beats any Black Lotus. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah. Cross your fingers for those, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, that too. Well, Jason, thank you very much for joining us here on the podcast. Uh, best of fortunes for Magic Kids um, uh, over the, the years to come. Uh, and I think it's just a, a wonderful thing you guys are doing uh, through the game. So uh, thank you for joining us and thank you for doing all that. Yeah, thank oh, you. Oh, you bet. Hope to see you guys um, in Vegas, November 19th through 21st, if you can safely do so. Safely is the uh, key word still today. Yes. Indeed, indeed. All right. Thank you very much, Jason. Thanks, Barry. Thanks, Evan. Well, that was nice having Jason join us at Magic Kids. Uh, I mean, they, they do some really good work uh, for. Uh, for, uh, for the youth using Magic the Gathering and gaming. Um, so it's, it's nice to be able to, to talk to him. But uh, let's just talk a little bit amongst uh, our, uh, each other. What I was a little curious, uh, what are some of your most cherished Magic memories, Magic stories? I mean, I, I know I definitely have a few. Um, Evan, do you, do you have one you want to share? I do have a few good ones, but I'll say my favorite one. So we all played Magic. Even today, it's still played in, uh, like in the back rooms of stores or like, uh, you know, in, in the front somewhere, just like somewhere, un sometimes a little unusual, but still played there, right? Everyone's gone through this. So uh, my first uh, major thing, you know, first, you know, packs coming up and things like that, I was like, oh, this is going to be so fun. Uh, it was originally going to be in the back of a discontinued Foot Locker store. <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh and then they were like oh we changed it so the location uh went into the back of a former sex shop because that was the only open oh, location wow. possible okay <laughs> so uh there's a few gritty t details i'll spare there but uh basically uh one of the we forget they forgot where they put the land cards because you know they always have that huge thing of land cards for people who need them land box yeah yeah and people they were looking where did it go where did it go because we forgot if people needed land uh it was in the middle of a box labeled dildos 
<laughs> someone had set it down in there and like no one could find it. I was doing okay that day. I was going one and one so far that day. I, you know, that's not bad for me. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, people, like it had to pause the whole thing and that's where the land was. And whenever land comes out to this day, I always think of it. <laughs> and you probably chuckle like a little schoolboy, right? And no one understands. <laughs> All right, Jim, you got one for us? I do. I need. I should relate the tale of the first uh, set opening uh, tournament I went to. Or I have completely forgotten what you call those release tournament. Pre release, release, release. Thank yes, it was. Thank you for that. So it this was for War of the Spark, and it involved me traveling up to Oakland to a store I've never been to before, see a whole like a new store, a whole bunch of faces I've never seen before, and it was, it was cool for a lot of reasons. First off, was like the great energy, that excitement of you know going to something that you haven't been to before because I got into magic like a lot later in life than a lot of people but another big thing was that the people i usually play magic with like they're out there competing trying to qualify for the pro tour they've been playing this all their lives and so whenever i play with them they just grind me into dust and so this the first time i actually go out to a tournament to see what other people are like i end up going two and two and you know winning a handful of packs and that was like really exciting. It's like, hey, maybe I'm not actually terrible at this game. So. You just had a trial by fire instead. <laughs> yes, I was forged in the fires of constant failure. <laughs> well, a memory of that uh, that came into my uh, my head was um, back when I was in junior high school in the uh, the mid 1990s. Magic was still a fairly fairly new game. I want to say alliances might have been the newest set at the time. And um, my seventh grade mathematics teacher, a lady named uh, Miss Matthews, which actually works for a math class, <laughs> um, she actually thought the, the game was, was kind of neat. And on Fridays, we would have um, these pop quizzes. The last half of class would be uh, the weekly math quiz. And turns out it, there was about four or five of us that actually played uh, the, 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 the game, the magic game, all in that class. And we were all, you know, we were all school buddies together um and um she would allow us if the test if the, we were done taking our test and we can stay largely quiet so we didn't disturb the other students she would let us flip our desks around so they're facing each other and we would spend the rest of class last 10 15 however many minutes of class playing games of uh, of, of magic together and of course back then you know no sleeves no deck boxes everything was uh uh, was unsleeved and kept together with rubber bands and you know maybe you kept it in a ziploc bag <laughs> mm -hmm. but um yeah that's just just a nice happy memory i have and i think back at you know just how cool that teacher was that <laughs> she let us do that in our seventh grade class that is a super cool teacher yeah shout out to uh, awesome. johnson junior high in las vegas for that one <laughs> well Storytelling's fun. We've told a lot of stories on this podcast, but unfortunately, this these might be the uh, last stories we tell, at least on the Magic Untapped podcast. Plenty more stories to tell on, the, on MagicUntapped.com and uh, the Magic Untapped YouTube channel, of course. But at least for now, this is the last goodbye from the Magic Untapped podcast as we uh, sunset it. Might bring it back at some time in the future, but for now, gentlemen, it's been fun. And... Uh, We'll do other things in the future. Sound good? Good. Great. Honor and a privilege. All right. I'm Barry White with Jim Avery and Evan Simon saying uh, tool time salute. Good night, everybody. Good night. Aloha.